Howdy! We're live! Aaron Boster here. Thank you for learning about MS with me. It is a beautiful Sunday afternoon, and I missed you guys in this growing global online village. I wanted to jump online in hopes that some of you from around this global village would jump online with me. And today, I'm going to be discussing a very hot topic in MS, nutrition. Uh, not a clinic day goes by where a family doesn't inquire about the best diet or the best foods to avoid or the best combinations of foods or things they should never ever eat. The reality is there's a lot to be said as it relates to diet and nutrition. And I thought I would spend a couple minutes with you guys. Hey, Mike F. Good to see you, my man. Um, as you jump online, please kindly tell me where you're calling in from. Just put a little uh, little note and tell me where it is that you're calling in from. I absolutely love seeing where everyone is in this global online village. Today, I'm going to be using that newer format where I discuss a didactic topic. Today's topic is nutrition, and then I'm going to open it up for a discussion. I want to take a few minutes to allow folks to jump online. There's 64 of you online right now. I'm going to scream out some hello, howdy, highs to Candy Duncan and Liz and even so as well. Valentine, Sunshine in Ohio. Leah is online. Sandy Watson. This is awesome. There's 67 of you. As you guys get online and get warmed up and ready, I have people calling in from Egypt. That's really neat. From England. That's really neat. From Illinois, that's really neat. From Ohio, yeah, this is fantastic. Now, uh, please keep in mind that during the didactic session, I'm not going to be reading uh, the live stream very carefully. So if you type something in there, um, I, I probably won't see it during the didactic portion of this live stream. Afterwards, I'm gonna turn to the chat and I'm gonna answer your questions related to the topic of today, which is nutrition. If you pose a question and I don't get to it, please don't fret. As you know, after this is over, I read through every single one of your comments and I extract out the comments and questions so that I can answer them in future live streams using a different format or in future videos. Also, I've got my bottle of water here. Let's open it up. And you are invited to join me in what I call the MS Water Challenge. What's the MS Water Challenge? I drink and you drink. So if you're at home uh, looking at your computer screen or on your phone, grab a glass of water. And when I chug, you chug. So let's fire it up. Mm. That is some high quality H2O. There is 82 of you online and it is a good time to get rocking and rolling talking about nutrition. Um, as I meet people and families impacted by MS, particularly at the time of diagnosis, almost without exception, people ask about diet and nutrition. They ask questions about, did I eat something that led to me getting this condition? By the way, the answer is no. They ask questions about, can I manage my MS exclusively through nutrition? And the answer is no. They ask, is there a certain diet that will help me out? And the answer is Yes, kind of. And I need to flush out that yes, kind of, that last comment, because there's a lot of information to unpack. Um, now, I see John uh, is asking a question about intermittent fasting, um, and that's pretty awesome. John, I am going to talk about intermittent fasting, but uh, bear with me while I get through this didactic discussion, because there's some content that I really want to share with you guys. For starters, please hear me loud and clear. There is no diet that has been proven to slow multiple sclerosis. I'm gonna repeat that. There's no diet that has been proven to slow multiple sclerosis. The reason I bring that up to you is if you go to a bookstore uh, in the mall, and uh, let me just write this down, playlist about MS nutrition, nutrition. Can't spell today, guys. Here is a playlist um, of, with six videos I've done on nutrition in case you guys want to check that out later. Um, but there's no diet that's been proven to slow down MS. And if you go to a bookstore and you say, hey, by the way, I have MS, they'll say, Ooh, oh, good, come with me. And they'll escort you over to their medical section and they'll point at all these books on the shelf written by people that have lots of initials after their last name. 
um, talking about the amazing diet X or Y and how it's going to help your MS. And I'm telling you today that when you review the science, there's no scientifically proven diet to slow multiple sclerosis. And you might say, well, are you sure, Aaron? Because I heard that the swank diet or that the this diet or that the that diet um, can cure multiple sclerosis. And that's not true. It's simply not the case. Um, there has not been data research proving that you can slow multiple sclerosis, slow down disease progression through diet, at least not directly. And that doesn't mean that diet's not important because diet is very, very important. Diet is super important. It's important for a lot of other reasons. And I'm going to get into those details here in a second. Uh, now, as we think about diet and we think about how it could impact um, MS in the disease course, there's a very interesting theory, and it's just a theory, about the microbiome. And I have a video on the microbiome. So the microbiome is the colonies of bacteria that live inside you. And there's some crazy statistic, like there's three bacterial cells for every one human cell, where there's a hundred bacterial genes for every human gene in the human body. So we, uh, by percentages, are more bacteria than human. And the microbiome particularly line the inside of our gut. And there are some theories that people with MS or people with autoimmune conditions have a uh, dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is a funny word. It means that the uh, populations of gut bacteria are jacked up. They're not the right kind. You got naughty ones instead of good ones. There's a theory that if you could impact the microbiome by changing the colonies of bacteria, you might be able to alter the immune response. And the reason I keep pointing out the theory is because it hasn't been proven yet. There's actually ongoing research right now looking at altering the microbiome, looking at things as unusual as fecal transplants, which sounds like what it is. Uh, and, and to date, we really don't have enough information. I can't look you in the eyes and say, you need to take these probiotics because these probiotics are going to revamp your microbiome, fix dysbiosis and make you better because we don't know that yet. I am delighted that there's research going on in this area. I don't know if it's going to um, turn out to be something fantastic, but I think it's very, very interesting. And there's a lot of ongoing research looking at the microbiome right now. Now, when I say that there's no uh, cure through diet and MS, that's uh, something that we need to come to terms with. Uh, and I have some patients that argue with me because they purchased one doctor's book who claimed that she cured her multiple sclerosis by changing her diet and essentially using what's a modified paleo diet. Well, she didn't cure her disease. Uh, she still has MS um, and uh, she didn't make it go away. And yet, I do think that there's a lot of things that we can do beneficially for us impacted by MS through changes of diet. And so I want to go through with you some very common sense things that are very easy conceptually to understand, but maybe rather challenging to actually put into clinical practice. So let's jump into a discussion about what we can do to impact the disease in some manner through diet. I have seen anecdotally, having done a clinic, taking care of folks with MS for some about almost 15 years, that when you change your diet, it can impact energy levels. Now, fatigue is the most common symptom in multiple sclerosis, hands down. And fatigue is a monster. It's so hard for even loved ones to understand how fatigued my patients are because it's not a fatigue that's normal. And I have seen patients make miraculous changes to their energy levels by simply changing their diet. And I want to walk through with you kind of what I've seen, what people have told me, what I have noticed, what I am increasingly believing to be true, although it's anecdotal evidence at this point. So for starters, fluid intake. People generally don't drink enough water. That's true. And if you are dehydrated, it can make fatigue worse. It can make cognitive fog worse. It can make motor fatigue and heat sensitivity worse. It can make depression worse. It can also make spasticity worse. 
So there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you're dehydrated. You can have worsening headaches because you're dehydrated. And yet most people don't do a very good job of drinking water. Sometimes I will learn that the only beverage that a patient consumes is some type of soda. So a can of soda with 12 tablespoons of sugar and caffeine and chemicals, and that's all they're doing to consume fluids is drinking essentially sugar chemical water. And it, it's, it's remarkable what happens when you trade out the diet Mountain Dew for agua. And so that's my first comment. If you are an, or someone you love is impacted by MS and you're having a discussion about diet, before you avoid plethoras of foods and before you buy expensive ingredients and do strange things, you might try to up your water game. And it sounds like kind of silly, except it's not silly. It actually makes a gigantic difference. And so in honor of the importance of water, the MS Water Challenge, I'm going to chug a new drink too. Ready? Go. Now, while I'm on the topic of beverages, let's talk about adult beverages. So adult beverages, ethanol, alcohol, booze, we're talking about beer, wine, liquor, stuff like that. I don't feel that it's required that someone with MS completely avoid alcohol forever. I don't think that's necessary. I do think that it's easy to overuse alcohol and that if we uh, decide as an adult to partake in an adult beverage, we need to do it responsibly. Now, of course, uh, responsibly, like don't drink and drive, but I'm talking about medically responsibly. The average male can metabolize two alcoholic beverages in the evening without any risk to his liver. And an alcoholic beverage would be one beer or one glass of wine or one mixed drink or one shot, just to give you an idea. So, so an, an average adult male could have two beers or two glasses of wine or two shots of whiskey and process it by his liver without any damage to the liver at all. A woman, an adult woman, on average, can drink one alcoholic beverage, so one glass of wine, one beer, one shot of whiskey, with no problems to her liver. And I want you to know that because that allows us to then start to think through decisions. I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you have three drinks, not at all. I'm just sharing with you that your liver can process two if you're a boy and one if you're a girl. Alcohol is a sedative hypnotic, all right? So, so alcohol is a sedative, and it can contribute to making you fatigued. And I just finished telling you that, that fatigue is a very common symptom in MS. And so I just want you to think through that, that if you're drinking alcohol, there's a risk that it may further contribute to your fatigue. Also, alcohol can worsen depression in some cases, and people with MS are more likely to be depressed than the general population. Does that mean you shouldn't drink? No, it just means I want you to know that so that you can think about the whole picture uh, when you decide to have an alcoholic beverage. Now, the average person with MS in the United States takes seven medicines a day. That's a lot of medicine. And many medicines are metabolized by your liver. So it's possible that because of the MS medications that you're on, that your liver is already under stress. And in that case, Keep in mind that adding alcohol to it may be of importance concern. When you take a medicine, you should literally ask your doctor, can I drink while I'm taking this pill? And your doctor may say, uh, no, that's really not a good idea. Or yeah, it's okay, but just use moderation. But I would ask the doctor to have that conversation. Um, I certainly would not want you to have an experience where you're taking MS medicines and drinking alcohol and the cumulative effects are such that you end up having something bad happen. And an example would be medicines like antispasmodics, like baclofen. So baclofen is a distant cousin of beer and mixing lots of baclofen with beer is a bad, bad scenario. So I do think even though the liver can handle two drinks if you're a boy, one drink if you're a girl, you have to think further and you have to think about which medicines am I choosing to take and could those medicines impact my ability to process alcohol or to be safe while drinking. And of course, the best answer is to ask your doctor. Also, when you go to pick your medicines up at the pharmacy, 
The pharmacist is a very wonderfully trained professional who can help translate for you. And you can ask them, can I drink with this pill? And if I do, what are some of the things that I need to be looking out for? So a couple words uh, as it relates to diet, and in this case, specifically about alcohol. So to wrap up my discussion about fluids, I've talked about the importance of water. I've talked about concerns with alcohol. And I really want to, I, I want you to think about um, the, the risk of empty calories when drinking fluids. Empty calories are calories that you can't use for nutrition or energy. And so I go back to like soda. So a can of, of soda has 12 tablespoons, not teaspoons, tablespoons of sugar. That is a boatload of sugar. And I am of the belief that processed sugar is actually not good for you. I'll come to that in a little bit later in this talk. But think about whether or not the beverage you're drinking is just a bunch of empty calories. I also have concerns when people drink too much juice. A lot of children love juice because it's sweet, because it's got sugar in it. And a lot of juice actually has excess sugar added to it. If you're going to pour a glass of orange juice, personally, I would rather you eat an orange. And I want to explain the difference. A glass of orange juice is probably like eight to 12 oranges squeezed. And it may be uh, processed. It may have chemicals in it. It may have sugar in it. Um, take a look at the ingredients when you buy a jug of orange juice. Sometimes it's not just juice. But what they've removed is the fiber. They've removed the pulp. So when you, when you have a glass of juice, it's very easy to guzzle it down. Um, there's no chewing involved. There's no fiber to process. And your body can very quickly take in that sugar. When you eat an orange, by example, instead of having a glass of orange juice, when you eat an orange, not only are you getting the juice that's inside the fruit, but you're also getting the fiber. And the fiber does a lot of good things. Amongst them is it helps fill you up. And so if you, you can't sit down and eat eight oranges quickly, literally, you can't just like burr, 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 and then devour eight oranges. It's going to take some time. The fiber is going to fill you up. And the longer it takes to eat it, the better it is uh, for you because your stomach tells your brain, hey, I'm good, dude. I'm full. But you could crush an, a, a glass of orange juice like that. And you won't get the signal that you're full. And so you can keep filling your gullet. And you're probably exposing yourself to a lot of excess sugars in the absence of fiber. So when you're thinking about fluids, I really want you to think critically. And I want you to think critically um, about juice. Because at first blush, it can sound kind of healthy. But there are some major, major things to consider when, uh, when drinking juice. So food for thought. The last, last comment I'll make about fluids before I start to talk about solid foods is caffeine. Now, many of you know that I love coffee. I mean, I love, 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 love coffee. Coffee is like my jam. I wake up in the morning and I'm excited to have a cup of coffee. And when I'm seeing patients in clinic, I love to have a cup of coffee with a patient. And I may do that for 10 patients in a row. I drink a lot of coffee. And I am not telling you that it's wrong or bad to have caffeine with MS. In fact, I'm not aware of any research whatsoever that suggests that caffeine is detrimental to multiple sclerosis. Now, caffeine is a stimulant, and so there are some issues there. And you need to make sure that it's not keeping you awake at night. That would be a problem because we want good sleep-wake cycles. Um, and I think everything in moderation is okay. And so if a patient tells me they like to wake up and have a cup or two of coffee, I don't see any problems with that whatsoever. If you are having trouble with insomnia, you need to pay very close attention to your caffeine intake because very commonly we may find that we uh, had a, a caffeinated beverage towards the latter half of the day and then we have trouble falling asleep at night. So those were some thoughts on nutrition specifically related to fluids. What's probably the best fluid to get into? It's probably water. And um, that's something that most adults might not love. When I started to try to drink water more, uh, I found that carbonated water was way better for Aaron. I enjoy carbonated water. I think I enjoy it because it's kind of like soda. I used to drink a lot of soda. I mean, a lot of soda. I would basically live on Diet 7 Up. And if you open my refrigerator, I just had cases of Diet 7-Up, and that's what I would drink instead of anything else. 
And when I reflect back on that and all of the chemicals that I can't pronounce that I was drinking, along with um, uh, just um, a, a, a bunch of not nutrition uh, in a can, that was not a good idea. That was not a good decision. And going from doing diet 7-Up to carbonated water helped me. Um, I love La Croix. I think those La Croix uh, taste delicious. Uh, we like the pomplamous uh, in my family. We do the grapefruit ones uh, or the lime ones. And if you haven't ever tried out sparkling water, try it out and see what you think. Another trick for water is to get it ice cold. Ice cold water, for me, tastes more refreshing. I don't know why. I just think it does. If you agree with me that ice cold water is better, type a comment in there. Or if you agree with me that carbonated water is the jam, type a comment and let me know that you agree. Or even if you don't, share with me your thoughts. Adding lemon or lime to water is delicious. I've heard uh, registered dietitians recommend people avoid that. But my opinion is that if it takes adding a lime to your water to get you comfortable drinking it, Lime it up because the water is going to be very, very helpful. Wow. I spent 21 minutes talking about fluids. I didn't plan on doing that, uh, but I didn't really have a script today. I just was excited to talk to you guys about nutrition. So I now want to transition from some general comments about fluids to comments about actual solid food. And the first thing that I want to say, if, if you take nothing away from Aaron's opinion about nutrition, I want you to take the following concept away. Ready? Here we go. I think it's important to eat real food. So what do I mean by that? What's real food? Well, the vast majority of people that I interact with don't actually eat real food. They eat fake food. They eat, for example, fast food. So if you go through a drive through and order lunch and it comes in a wrapper and, and there's some fries and a, and a hamburger and you eat it all, you didn't eat food. I'm sorry to share that with you. That's not real food. That's fake food. And I can prove it to you. Here's an experiment that will cost you like $3. Go to your local fast food place and purchase a hamburger or a cheeseburger or something. And then don't eat it. And then open it up and put it on the counter or on your table or on your desk and don't touch it. And what you'll find is if you come back a week later, it looks the same. If you come back a month later, it looks the same. The stuff doesn't rot. Um, I've seen photographs of professors that have literally kept um, fast food cheeseburgers for years. Um, and they just become like these hard little cheeseburger rocks. And that's because... That burger is full of chemicals. It's full of additives and a bunch of, excuse my language, kind of crap, which keeps it looking fantastic. They have put lots of sugar in the cheeseburgers, in the meat, in the cheese, in the buns. Ketchup is basically a bunch of sugar with a little bit of tomato sauce mixed in. And so you're not eating real food, guys. Food should rot. If you have food, it should rot. It shouldn't just be able to sit out forever. And so you, when you eat a bunch of French fries, you're not eating a nutritious potato. There's a potato base, but if you're eating fast food French fries, that was fried in some disgusting stuff and they put sugar in it and they put chemicals in it to preserve it. That's why if you come back a couple of days later, the French fries look like French fries. They didn't rot. Food should rot. And I challenge people, and this is actually a really hard challenge, to avoid fake foods. I'll give you another example of fake foods that I used to eat a lot of, and those are power bars. I used to get these power bars, and there's lots of different kinds out there. And I really think a power bar in 2019 is code for candy bar. And I would get these uh, power bars that were supposed to be protein-laden, nutrition-focused um, you know, power bars. And when you read the ingredients, there's still a lot of chemicals in them. And I, I, it's not real food. It was like probably, I imagine, on a conveyor belt. They make just a, a line of this stuff, and they chop it up, and then they put it in the plastic, and they sold it to me, and I bought it. And so I would be in clinic back in the day drinking a Diet 7-Up and eating a power bar. And I remember one of my nurse practitioners who is super into fitness. Uh, she is very, very physically active, 
very, very physically fit, very healthy. She commented, she said, you know, Dr. Boster, you're not eating food. And at the time, I have to be honest, I didn't understand what she was telling me because I said, well, I'm eating it. It must be food. But I wasn't eating food. I was eating fake stuff. And so if you're looking to up your nutrition game, you don't have to start to do uh, so-and-so's diet. Why don't you just start by eating real food and avoiding fast food? I also want to recommend that you avoid processed foods. When you look at a label, if you can't pronounce the words in the label, I don't think you should eat that food. If it's got a bunch of chemicals in it, I recommend that that's not the food that you want to be eating. You want to eat food that has ingredients like it's an apple, like an apple. All right. That's the only ingredient in an apple. Um, it's not an apple fritter that has a bunch of sugar and processed stuff and simple carbohydrates and a bunch of chemicals to keep it from spoiling. There's a really, really big difference. And so you can have a major impact, a major impact in the quality of your nutrition simply by avoiding processed fake foods and eating real foods. As an experiment, go to your refrigerator, go to your cabinet and look at the ingredients in the food that you've bought. You bought a pizza in, uh, in the frozen food section. Look at all the ingredients in it. You'll notice that it's not just flour, water, cheese, and tomato sauce. There's a bunch of chemicals and a bunch of added sugar oftentimes that they put in those frozen pizzas. And you may not even be fully aware of it. So food for thought, pun intended. Um, I'm challenging folks to up their water game, to avoid sugar-laden soda pops and sugar-laden juices. I'm asking them to uh, drink alcohol in moderation. Um, I'm asking them to be cognizant of when they're drinking caffeine. And as it relates to foods, I recommend avoiding sugar-laden foods and processed foods with refined sugars in them and with chemicals for words that you can't pronounce. Now, when you get into some of these proposed diets for MS, there's a couple categories. One of them is a anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, and a swank diet would be an example of that. And this is largely a vegetable-based diet. It's intended to avoid uh, something that at least Dr. Swank thought was pro-inflammatory. And whereas it's never been proven to slow MS, I have many patients that when they avoid certain foods, they feel better. Now, does that mean you need to be a vegetarian? I don't feel that it does. I'm not recommending that you're a vegetarian. I think that having a plethora of different nutritional foods is important. And I think that lean proteins are important. And so I am a big fan of fish and chicken. Uh, now, growing up in Ohio, I've eaten my fair share of beef. Um, but honestly, to uh, I recommend lean meats. So fish and chicken are the best ones, in my opinion. And I think that if you're going to eat red meat, and I certainly like to eat red meat, I would do so in moderation. Um, I would try to have some fish or chicken uh, more often than I had uh, beef. And that's just uh, my two cents. There are other diets uh, that are very popular these days. And one of the most popular ones is a modified paleo diet. So a modified paleo diet uh, where people are avoiding certain types of foods. Specifically, I have seen anecdotally people report remarkable results when they remove uh, dairy, when they remove grains and processed grains, when they cut out alcohol. Um, and if you're trying to figure out whether that makes sense for you, I have a very easy solution. Do an elimination diet. Give yourself a month. Um, I did this with something called the Whole30. Now, I'm not getting reimbursed or sponsored for anything I'm saying. Um, and so I'm not pushing the Whole30 on you. It's just something that I did with my family. And I kind of enjoyed the learning process going through the Whole30. Because that's a particular diet where you cut out all these different food types for a month. And then you can slowly add them back in. And the reason I found that educational personally was I learned a lot about what happens when I eat a lot of dairy. Turns out that I feel kind of bloated and I feel sluggish and slow um, and my GI system is not awesome. And it turns out that when I avoid dairy, I, Aaron, personally, when I avoid dairy, I feel better. Is that healthier for me? I don't know, but it gives me more energy and it might give you more energy. And so if you're wondering, you don't have to 
to wonder. You can find out for yourself. Simply uh, partic participate in some type of uh, elimination diet where you remove certain things from your diet for a set period of time, and then you slowly add one thing at a time, and then you can learn firsthand. Uh, I'll give you another example. It turns out that um, my wife and I had eliminated beans, legumes, and it turns out that legumes didn't seem to have a negative effect on us. When we added legumes back into our diet, nothing bad happened. Um, and so we feel that for us, we do decent eating legumes. So I'm obviously not proposing today, you need to do diet X. I'm instead trying to have a more general conceptual conversation. And if you're wondering whether or not you would fare better by removing wheat, do an experiment, cut wheat out of your diet for a month. And at the end of the month, think about how you feel, and then you can slowly add wheat back in. And you may find out that it makes no difference whatsoever. You may find out that it makes a really big difference. And what I'm looking for is energy levels and overall sense of well-being, et cetera, et cetera. Now, before I open uh, up the discussion uh, to a more general question and answer on nutrition, a couple other comments. A lot of people don't eat regular meals. A lot of people don't eat a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you don't do that, you're making your life harder. You got to fuel the machine. And so if you're getting up to start your work day and you haven't eaten anything and you're going all the way until lunch, unless you're doing some type of modified um, fasting diet, I think that you have to be cautious about that because you're, you're kind of robbing your body of nutrition and it doesn't make you lose weight to do that because your body recognizes, hey, I don't have any nutrition, excuse me, I don't have any energy. So your metabolism actually slows down. And I really think that if you're trying to up your nutrition game, one easy thing to do is to start to schedule meals. Have a breakfast. It doesn't need to be a giant breakfast, but eat something. Eat an egg or have a yogurt or, or have some granola or eat a piece of fruit. But the point is feed the engine. I think it's important to eat a breakfast. I think it's important for you to eat a lunch. And I think it's important for you to eat a dinner. And if you're not currently scheduling three meals a day, you may find that by scheduling meals, you do better. Your insulin levels stay more constant. Your sugar levels aren't bouncing up and down. You're keeping the nutrition in your body. Likewise, and this is one that I'm not very good at, but I'm working on it. Try to avoid snacking. I am uh, notorious for turning into a monster around 10 p.m. Uh, a lot of times I haven't done the best job of eating during the day and kids are finally asleep and golly gee, I get really hungry. And I do this thing where I make a, a loop around my first floor. I'll go from the living room where I'm hanging out with my wife into the kitchen and I'll open the refrigerator and I'll just stare at it. And I'll stare and I'll look at all the stuff. And sometimes I'll just start eating out of the refrigerator. I'm embarrassed to tell you it's true. And I, without paying attention, can consume major, major calories at night when I'm not really all that hungry. Now, if I had done a better job of eating a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner, and then I used a little bit of willpower, I mean, come on, Aaron, you can do it, and, and stopped eating a lot of food at night, I would probably feel much better. I would probably uh, do a better time of controlling my weight um, and my caloric intake. And that's something that I am personally going to be working on um, as I move forward over these next couple months. Um, I really want to hunker down and see if I can, I can work on that specific thing. So today we're talking about nutrition. Um, I've been uh, talking with you now for about 33 minutes. There's 171 people online, which warms my heart. If you guys like this topic of nutrition, give it a thumbs up. Um, I would love to see a uh, hundred thumbs up. If I could pull it off, that would just be super awesome. So let's see if we can kick that thumbs up number. Now, Let's turn our attention to some questions and I'm going to stop the didactic portion and I'm going to start to read the live chat and answer your questions about nutrition. I'm asking you to please limit the discussion to nutrition today. There's a lot more that we can talk about. We can talk about vitamins like vitamin D and biotin. Uh, there's a host of things, but I really want to open up the lines and allow people to ask questions. So let's jump in. So True Tech says disabled people uh, often end up living alone and not eating well. Uh, and True Tech, you're right. 
that sometimes there are cultural barriers to eating well. Sometimes uh, the nutritional foods can actually uh, be harder to go get because you can't run through the fast food. You have to go into the grocery store, which isn't easy for everyone to do. Uh, they can be more expensive sometimes. And nutritional foods require a lot of planning and sometimes a lot of preparations. And that can be really hard for someone. I'm not saying that this is easy. I am telling you that if you really want to dig in and improve your nutrition game, that might be something that you have to sort out. And you may have to uh, figure out some creative things. There are services now that will deliver fresh produce to your house. Uh, we use them on occasion here at my house. Uh, and there's ways of doing food prep ahead of time. Um, many of you might know Rachel Ray. Uh, Rachel Ray is a, a food channel TV personality. I love her 30 minute cooking. Uh, she has all these awesome recipes um, and I've made a lot of them myself and they do not take very long. They're not very complicated. Now, if you are disabled and for example, chopping with a knife is hard for you, you might need to figure out some workarounds. You might need to figure out um, like a, a slap chop device that'll help chop for you, or you may need to depend upon a friend or family to help you do your food prep. But I want you to be creative. Many of us can use a, a steam cooker or a pressure cooker um, or a crock pot, and you can throw in some ingredients and hit some buttons, and a couple hours later, it's cooked slowly and delicious for you. And so you're right, True Tech. There can be limitations to access to healthy food and access to prepare, prepare, no, excuse me, preparing healthy food. But that's the challenge before you. And I, I want you to take that challenge head on. Oh my gosh, in the time we've been talking, there's 103 thumbs up. Mwah, mwah. Thank you guys, that was really awesome. Uh, you guys are the best freaking village in the universe. You know, I have to tell you, this was a hard week for me. I had a rough week um, and it warms my heart to get a chance to talk to you guys. So thank you for that gift that you're giving me right now. Now let's look at some more questions. Oh, this is a good one. Um, so someone, where did it go? I lost it. So there it is. So Mr. Cadiz writes intermittent fasting 16.8. And I want to talk about intermittent fasting. So some of you may be familiar with the concept of intermittent fasting, and it typically takes on one of two forms. Either the first one is certain days of the week, you don't eat, you just drink water. Uh, I actually have a, a, a couple of friends that are amazing MS docs uh, in Michigan. Uh, Rainey uh, is a buddy of mine, um, and, and uh, Rob Pace is a buddy of mine, and these guys up in Michigan, they actually do intermittent fasting. And if I'm, remembering, if I'm remembering correctly, one of the ways that Rainey does it is he just doesn't eat on Monday. So quite literally, he eats Sunday. Monday, he just has some coffee and water all day long, and then he eats on Tuesday. And that's called intermittent fasting. That's one way to do intermittent fasting. So um, some people may choose not to eat Monday and Thursday. Now, if you are listening to me and you're thinking about intermittent fasting, I want you to talk to your clinician prior to doing it because it can be tricky and it's not for everyone. Um, there's another way of doing intermittent fasting and that's what Mr. Um, oh, where'd, your, where'd your name go? Um, and what that kind of is like, it's not where you take a day and don't eat. It's where for a certain time during the day, you don't eat. And so for a certain set period of time, you may only eat, for example, between the hours of noon and 6 p.m. That would be an example. And the rest of the time from 6 p.m. until the following morning or the following day at noon, you don't eat. And that's another form of intermittent fasting. And I think that it, and um, there's been some studies looking at intermittent fasting in MS. And I want to share a few of those studies with you. My favorite study for intermittent fasting has to deal with the uh, Muslim practice of Ramadan. So in the Muslim faith, there is a month, a very holy month called Ramadan. And during that holy month, uh, practitioners don't eat the difference between a wax string. There's enough light to tell the difference. You can't eat yet. When it's dark enough that you can't differentiate the color string, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting, um, that's when it's okay to eat. A lot of Muslims in the world, a bunch of people don't eat during daylight hours. They don't drink during daylight hours either. They, they eat their calories in the evening when it's dark, and they do that for 30 days. 
And I am asked frequently by patients and families, looked at it. And the answer is that it's safe. It's not dangerous uh, to do that. And, and I like knowing that for faith in, because of the, this condition. And so that's a study that I thought was very interesting. There's a couple other studies looking at intermittent fasting and MS, all kinds of different flavors and styles. And what they found was it is a way of losing weight. Um, it, it wasn't found to be more, um, but it was a successful way of losing weight. And some people felt like it gave them more energy. Um, it's not something that I am wholeheartedly recommending and I want you to get out there and start intermittent fasting, but I think it's fascinating. And it's something that uh, a lot of people uh, are trying these days. So if you have ever participated in intermittent fasting, please share with us in the comments section, your style of intermittent fasting. You know, are you, are you not eating on Mondays and Thursdays or are you only eating between the hour of this and that? And if you've done it, what do you think? One cautionary comment about intermittent fasting is you still need to eat adequate nutrition. So if you need to eat, say, 2,000 calories and you're only eating four hours a day, you got to get those, those calories in you. And I would probably recommend that most people try reducing uh, their, their total caloric intake as opposed to doing intermittent fasting. But it's something that's very interesting. Um, and I like the fact that there's been some research on it. So Mr. Cadiz, uh, thank you very much for, um, for bringing that up. And uh, my wonderful wife just brought me some more water so we can knock this bottle out and continue the MS water challenge. So I'm going to drink and you drink with me. Got to get my hydration on. Let's look at some other questions here. So here's a question from Liam C123321. So Liam writes, question. Hi, Dr. B. Well, hello, Liam. Hope you're doing good on this Sunday. What do you think about drinking a probiotic yogurt drink each morning? I don't think there's anything wrong with a probiotic yogurt drink. I want you to look carefully and make sure that they haven't uh, snuck in a bunch of processed sugar into that yogurt drink. And I would certainly want you to check and make sure that it's not full of weird chemicals with words that you can't pronounce. But I think yogurt's pretty fantastic. Um, if you have a problem with dairy, that might not be the best option. But if, if dairy doesn't bother you, I think yogurt's a great source of calcium. Yogurt is a great source of protein. And I don't think it's bad to take probiotics. Liam, let me say a few other things about probiotics. Now, I mentioned earlier about this whole concept of the microbiome and dys dysbiosis and having the bad bacteria in your gut. And there's a theory that you could change it by taking probiotics, but we don't know which probiotics. We don't know which are the good bacteria yet. And so I'm not recommending that people do probiotics for that purpose. However, anecdotally, many, many people I know, folks that I take care of in clinic, um, and friends and family have shared that when they take probiotics, they don't have as much diarrhea, they don't have as much bloating, they don't have as much problems with moving their bowels, they feel like they have better control over their gut. And so I think taking a probiotic yogurt drink in the morning is a swell idea. And if you find it's valuable, I think that's awesome. So Liam, if you do like doing that, give me a little comment and tell me what your experience has been like. There's 132 people that are still online, and that is really cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here with me right now in this growing global online village as we talk about MS and nutrition. Um, so Sonia writes, what about farm fresh eggs? Well, Sonia, as, as you well know, um, I have city chickens, and this morning my breakfast was four eggs that I literally got out of the chicken coop, um, washed them off, cracked them, and ate them. And I love farm fresh eggs. Um, I think eggs are a great source of protein. Uh, I love, uh, me personally, uh, I, I love eggs. I like them hard boiled. I like scrambled eggs. Eggs are my jam. Now, do they need to be farm fresh? I don't know. I mean, I think that farm fresh eggs taste better, but I think that eggs, however you're getting them, is a wonderful source of nutrition. Uh, it's interesting, the, the eggs that we have, uh, they come straight from the chicken. And when chickens lay an egg, there's a, a, a membrane called the bloom. I didn't know this. I learned this when we started to have chickens. It's this clear membrane that's over the outside of the egg and keeps it airtight. 
And so when you get fresh eggs, you don't have to keep them in the refrigerator. We keep our eggs on the counter and they'll last for well over a month uh, before they would start to go bad. But when you use the egg, you have to wash the outside surface um, just in case the chicken has, you know, walked on it and got, you know, uh, chicken poop or gotten, uh, you know, mud on it. So you wash all that off. Um, but I definitely like farm fresh eggs. And Sonia, I hope you're having a, a good Sunday. What else do we have going on here? Heather Miller writes in, I've heard that you need to, quote, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. That's not bad advice. The reason I like that quote, besides it's cute, is number one, it's recommending that you eat three meals. Many red-blooded Americans that I know, they don't eat three meals. And I think that if you're trying to up your nutrition game, one of the first things you want to do is to schedule real meals. The second thing is we're front-loading our energy so that you're you're, you're, you're taking on the most amount of energy and the most calories in the beginning of your day, which gives you ample time all day long to burn those calories. It's also when your metabolism is the highest during the course of the day. If you eat a giant meal and then go to bed, your body's slowing down and you're not going to be metabolizing those calories as quickly. And so I think there may be some value in kind of thinking about the, the structure of that. That's a good one. Thank you for sharing. So Wendy writes... Question about caffeine. I have fatigue, what a shock, and need to get a kick of energy. Caffeine choices. So caffeine in and of itself is probably not very dangerous. And caffeine is added to a lot of beverages. My opinion is I'm looking for natural sources of caffeine. So I'm of the opinion that coffee and tea are your best bet. I personally would avoid soda and I extend soda to include not just the Coca-Colas of the world, the colas in our season, and whatnot, but also those power drinks. So drinks like Monster, which have a bunch of caffeine, but they also have other chemicals and stuff that I'm not too into. That's my opinion. Um, it doesn't make me right, it just makes me opinionated. But if I was to look for a source of caffeine, for me, it would be a cup of coffee. And I'm not talking about a Kappa Rappa Flappa Chappa Dappa that's got all kinds of chemicals in it. I'm talking about a cup of coffee where the ingredient is coffee, you know, water and coffee beans. What else do we have going on here? Here's a question um, from Corrine Looney, um, who writes, how much biotin should someone with MS take? That is an awesome question. Now, biotin is a vitamin. Uh, it's B7. And before I talk about biotin, let me just talk about vitamins. Americans spend billions with a B, so billions of dollars on vitamins and minerals and supplements. And the vast majority of that stuff we pee out. If you're taking a, a, a vitamin or vitamins, look at the color of your urine. You may find that you have this gorgeous uh, yellow color urine. Those are the vitamins. You could sell your urine um, because it's packed full of vitamins. The reason is most vitamins we can't absorb um, into our fat. Only a couple are absorbed in the fat. The rest are water soluble. And so you can only take in so much and then you pee the rest out. I am not of the opinion that it's a good idea to just airy fairy take a bunch of vitamins. I think that most adults could benefit from taking a multivitamin like a one-a-day multivitamin, like a Centrum Silver or something like that. And I think that's not a terrible idea, but anything beyond that, I think should only really be done in consultation with your doctor. Now, as you know, one of the vitamins that I talk a lot about is vitamin D. And I like to give patients vitamin D3 because it's more easily absorbed into the human body. Vitamin D is fat soluble. And so it is possible to take too much but the amount that we need is a lot more than what I think we realized uh, back 50 years ago when they made vitamin recommendations. So we want the vitamin D level, which can be checked in a laboratory, to be between 50 and 100 if you are impacted by MS. And the data, as I review it, looks pretty compelling that the higher the level of vitamin D, the better the disease outcome. Decrease the tax, decrease disability progression, stuff that's good for you. And so I do believe that in addition to a multivitamin, my patients need to have their vitamin D levels checked. And then we need to supplement the vitamin D to drive the level up above 50. That's a practice that I have uh, with my clinic patients. And I think it's an important one. 
But you didn't ask about vitamin D, you asked about a different vitamin, biotin or B7. So let's talk a little bit about biotin. Sorry, I'm just gonna change positions in this chair. I don't know if you guys noticed, I, I went to shave and I used a trimmer and I took my glasses off and I got the trimmer out and it had a guard already on it. And I shaved only to realize that it was on level one. And I normally don't do it on level one. So I feel a little bit naked, um, but it'll grow back. So B7 biotin is supposed to help with the integrity of your nails and your hair. Uh, clearly, I'm not taking very much biotin, guys. And you can pick up biotin over the counter at three milligrams. Three milligrams is what it's typically sold in. And so if people have alopecia or thinning hair or brittle nails, very frequently they'll take a little biotin in the form of a pill, three milligrams a day over the counter. There is some really, really exciting research going on right now in multiple sclerosis studying ultra high dose biotin. So not three milligrams, I'm talking about 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams of biotin in one study showed that it could slow down disability and primary progressive MS, which is insane. In another study, it showed that it could slow disability progression in MS. Now guys, don't run away. I just realized that my computer is about to die and I forgot to plug it in. And so give me a second. I just got to plug in my computer before it uh, dies. Sorry about that, guys. I was not very well prepared. Don't run away. We're talking about biotin. Once I get a little electricity, there. Whew. It was down to 4%. I thought I was going to lose you. And these two trials that showed that high dose biotin could slow progression in primary progressive MS and slow brain shrinkage in primary progressive MS took everyone um, by storm. And it's very, very exciting. And there's actually a clinical trial that is close to enrollment. We should hear the results probably in the next year, which was a, a properly developed large scale clinical trial looking at high dose biotin. So we will learn much more in the very near future. Now I'll share with you that anecdotally uh, in clinic, I have uh, recommended that some people consider taking high dose biotin. And there's an important caveat. And uh, I've talked about this in live streams before, but I, I definitely want you to hear me say it now that if you take ultra high dose biotin, it can change assays, it can change laboratory tests because many laboratory tests that, that use antibodies use biotin as part of the makeup of the test. So if your blood has a bunch of biotin in it, it can interfere with the way the test is interpreted and you can have false results. For example, you can have a, um, you can have a false positive hepatitis test where your hepatitis B will come back antibody positive, even though you actually have never been exposed. And it's because the high dose biotin in your blood messed up the test. You can see abnormal thyroid tests. That's also very common. There's a hosts of tests and including uh, cardiac enzymes. Uh, so if you have chest pain and go to the ER, they'll draw cardiac enzymes. But if you're on biotin, it can change the results. So what do you do in that instance? Well, fortunately, biotin can leave the body very quickly. Um, I, one paper suggested that you, biotin leaves the body in three days. It's my recommendation that if you're taking high dose biotin, the way that I've described, you, you want to do that in consultation with your neurologist. First off, don't just go get some, but second off, you need to tell all your other doctors, Hey, I'm on high dose biotin and it could change test results. And I recommend that you take at least five days off biotin prior to going to the laboratory or even prior to going to the doctor's office. Very commonly, when you go to the doctor's office, she's gonna to wanna to draw some blood, right? And so anticipating that might happen, if you stop the biotin five days beforehand, when you go into the lab or go into the doctor's office, you're not gonna have a problem of interfering with laboratory testing. So that was a great question. Thank you for asking it. So Lisa Harris shares with us that she does intermittent fasting, 16 hour fasting, all meals within eight hours. Works awesome, she says. She tells us that she sleeps better, symptoms are quiet, feel amazing, lost a ton of weight. Lisa, thank you for sharing. That's really cool. Um, I love reading that. I'm looking forward to seeing what other people um, have experienced. All right, looking for another question. So Lisa Zito writes, more be complex then. Well, again, I don't think that we need to 
to uh, spend a lot of money on multiple B vitamins unless you have a deficiency. And most commonly, I'll see people want to take uh, B12. Now, if you have a low B12 level, you want to supplement it. And it's a very easy lab test to check your B12 level. Do I think that you need to have ultra high labs uh, and look at your levels, uh, particularly B12? And if it is low, then it's reasonable to supplement it. But I don't think that in, in addition to the multivitamin and the vitamin D, that we should all be taking uh, a, a B complex. I don't think that without checking labs, people with MS should be taking extra B complex. That's just my two cents. All right. Craig Smith uh, says, hey, Dr. B, finally made a live stream. Um, P.S. Hi from Scotland. Well, Craig, it is awesome to have you online. Scotland is a, a wonderful uh, place that I've had a chance to visit on a few occasions. Um, thank you for spending Sunday with me. Let's look for another question. Um, Narto Kung writes, what about a false TB test? Um, I have to tell you that I don't remember specifically whether um, high dose biotin can affect TB. I'm, I'm not sure. It very well could, but I'm not remembering right now. And so again, I would stop biotin five days before having a TB test. That way it wouldn't interfere. So Haley writes, oh, did I lose it? Sorry, this skips around and then I get lost, guys. Forgive me. All right, let's look for another question before we wrap up. Where is that question from Haley? Sorry, Haley. Oh, I can't find it. There we go. Haley writes, hello from the, oh, I can't pronounce the word, Orkney Islands. Um, we have some of the highest prevalence of MS in the world. I'm pretty sure that's in Northern Scotland, if I'm remembering. The islands uh, have a heavy meat dairy based diet, contributing factor perhaps. Haley, that's a fantastic question. I do not know the answer. If I were to guess, I would think it has more to do with the genetics of the population um, in Northern Scotland, because genetically, uh, folks probably share a lot of the same genes, particularly genes encoding for the immune response, but there also may be environmental factors. Now, I don't think that a particular diet has been proven to increase the risk for MS, except for low vitamin D. Um, and that's an interesting point, because in Northern Scotland, there might not be a lot of sun there. Uh, I, I don't uh, I, I don't think that we can blame it on the diet alone, uh, but I think it's it's a very interesting phenomenon. And there's a couple pockets in the world where we see very high prevalence of MS, and that's an opportunity for us to learn. Um, thank you for joining us on the live stream today, and thank you for sharing that. All right, let's look for another question. Melanie Parker, a longtime viewer, is on right now, and Melanie asks, question, are there studies about diet and lesions? So many people think anti-inflammatory diet can prevent lesions. So there is no science that says an anti-inflammatory diet removes lesions. And I think that we get ourselves confused. When, we, when I, as an immunologist, talk about inflammation in the brain, I don't imagine that I'm impacting inflammation in the brain by avoiding an inflammatory food. And a lot of times I think that um, the, the logic is a, is a little bit choppy. So someone might say that eating uh, bacon is an inflammatory food uh, and they have reasons about the curing of it and the high fat and salt and whatever. But I don't I don't know that there's actually I do know that there's no science suggesting that eating that pro inflammatory food results in lesions. Uh, I think that when people tell you, oh, you need to clean up your diet to help with MS, that's a version of honey. that looks so good. It's just someone with good intentions giving like non-medical advice. And I, I, I think that we have to take that with a smile. And we have to recognize that people love us and they're trying to help us, even if what they're saying may not be based in science. And again, I don't think it's wrong to bring these topics up with your doctor and ask your doctor, what does she think? What does he think? And if, if you want, you can always be referred to sit down with a registered dietitian. A registered dietitian is someone that has uh, extra education and training specifically to help you game out altering your diet in a safe and appropriate manner. Uh, there's a lot to be done. We've talked about some of those things today. It's been an hour. Uh, I have had a wonderful time talking to you guys, and I genuinely want to thank you. Uh, I have grown to depend upon this global online village. 
uh, as much as I'm hopeful that I'm sharing education, I'm energizing, I'm empowering you, I want to let you guys know that it's a two-way street and that knowing that you're out there, knowing uh, that we're here together, it, it means the world to me. And so I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for learning about MS with me. My name is Aaron Boster, and I started this YouTube channel years ago to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits. And it's my hope that continually through my videos and through my live streams, I can help you learn too. I'm trying to put out a video about once or twice a week and jumping online to do live streams as often as I can pull it off. So until the next time we see each other on the internet, take care.